Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Aspiring Women Achieving More Masterclass Series. I could not be more grateful to have Karen Azer with us here today. Um, it's a, what an honor to um, have been part of her journey, just watching from the sidelines every step of the way for her making her dreams come true in teaching women more about financial literacy. Uh, I think it's so incredibly important, especially as a single mama, that I know I had choice in my life that I wouldn't have had had I not had uh, you know, some financial knowledge that I did. So Karen, I'm so grateful for your friendship. I'm so grateful uh, to hear this presentation today. So go right ahead, take us away. All right. Well, thanks, Mandy. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Karen Azer. I'm co-founder of Financial Literacy for Her with my partner, Erica Neal. She will be on shortly, so she'll be able to chime in with anything that I might forget. But I have to tell you, I absolutely adore Mandy. I adore this whole mission of Aspiring Women Achieving More, because if it wasn't for AWAM ladies, this company would not exist. Now, two, two ways that it started was actually Mandy who was interviewing me for her. She was doing the, these three-minute segments and asking me what my mission was and what, what really meant, kind of what my why was. I discovered my why in those three minutes and discovered it was financial literacy, and financial literacy for her was born right, right then and there. And so that happened late last fall and, uh, you know, 2020. And then um, I also was participating in the AWAM accountability group on Fridays. And so I've been an active participant in that. And my partner, Erica Neal, also was a part of that. And so Erica heard me talking about this company. And I, was, I really had a heart for the um, mindset side of it. And she kept talking about, I really want to do instructional videos. And so before you know it, she said, wait a minute, I need somebody who can do mindset matters. Why don't we join forces and join this company? So last January, we joined forces and started financial literacy for her. And so we're so excited to be here. Lots of things have really um, taken off since then. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And But I know you came here for content. So let's get into some content now. And then um, towards the end, I'll give you a little bit more of information on why this mission for financial literacy and what we're doing about that specifically within our company. So um, share my screen. There we go. All right. So what I'm going to be talking about today is uncovering those money blocks that are keeping you from realizing your financial dreams. So, um, so Earl Nightingale said, whatever we plant in our subconscious mind and nourish with repetition and emotion will one day become a reality. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of this stat, but 90% of what we do every day is in our subconscious minds. And that's, that's what is, that is running our behaviors and what we're doing. Only 10% of it is at the conscious level. So you know what we need to do, ladies? Oops, wrong, wrong direction. What we need to do is we need to uncover our minds. We need to find out what is going on in that 90%, what drives us, and uncover all the things that have happened to us when we're children that could be that could, could be impacting how we behave. And so if you guys don't know, I'll do a cheap plug right here. This is the cover of our book. Uh, it's, it's called Mind of Gold, A Girlfriend's Guide to financial freedom. And this, and one of the big things that we do is we really integrate every, you can't deal with your finances without mindset and vice versa, because they are so, integr so integral to each other. And so let's uncover it, because if we don't know what's under there, we, can, we can't start dealing with it, can we? So most of our money messages, most of those subconscious messages that we have are rooted in our childhood. Some of the positive messages are, we can use money to make the world a better place. Money is good because it provides us with what we need. You see your parents have a calm, constructive conversations about money, and so it doesn't trigger you. And that's probably about 2% of the population. So we'll move over to the negative messages. And those messages, there's some messages like money is evil and rich people are greedy or, or I wonder who she had to take advantage of to get that job. Or you, you grew up and you were seeing your parents fight about money all the time. And so it just would make you cringe and you made a vow to yourself very early on. I just don't want to discuss money. If I put my hand over my face and I ignore it, it won't be there. And we, we move on with our life and, and we... We have so many things from going to where we want to go. 
Um, so what is a money block specifically? It's a series of thoughts, feelings, or behaviors that get in the way of us accomplishing what we want for to achieve financial success. Now, signs that you have a money block or you feel like you, you are doing everything right, but you're getting nowhere, or you have the knowledge and the wants, but not the results. How many of us struggle with that? Or you self-sabotage opportunities to make more money. And I've seen so many, you know, I, I've been a part of this group very, very long time. So I've really been paying attention to a lot, a lot of the struggles that the different women, well, everybody has, but specifically I focus on women. And self-sabotage is such a big problem. Um, you jump into freelancing without a plan. Or, and that's another big issue for a lot of people who are wanting to get away from their W-2s. They're like, yeah, I'm going to start freelancing. I'm just going to give, give my money away. And we don't have any value. And, and, and we really hurt ourselves and we really subject ourselves to, to more money lies. Or you constantly say, I am bad with money. But you know what? Our, our minds were created to obey us. So when we say I'm bad with money, our, our, our brains say, yes, ma'am, I'm here at your service. I will be bad with money and I will obey you. So it's up to us to start paying attention to what we say and think about how we can become great with money. And some of the other things you may do is avoid looking at bank statements or overspending on credit cards. Now, I hope if some of these resonate with you, you're, start, you're starting to write them down. And please share in the chat if there's anything that uh, comes to mind or say, yeah, that's me. So some other questions you might be considering as you're thinking about this is, what do you say about money? Do you have a positive, negative, or confused tone when you talk about discussing money with family or friends? What do your friends and family say about money? And are you surrounding yourself with um, people with a positive relationship to money? Because you know what? It is so, so important. Tribe, 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 tribe. And may I say again, tribe. And that is because you know, they say we are the sum of the five people who we surround ourselves with the most, the things that they say, because we just absorb it, we listen to what they're saying. And so if we're not careful who we hang around with, we will we will start finding ourselves saying some of those same negative things. So that's something you really need to consider and take stock of who you, you're hanging around with. And the other thing is, how do you feel when you spend money? Do you... Do, do you, I know some people who actually physically want almost vomit when they spend money. They feel so bad about it. And then in the other spectrum, you have people who get such a huge adrenaline rush. It's like, you know, mainlining money. And, you know, it, it really are, neither, neither end of the spectrum is very healthy. So again, that's what we want to talk about a little bit more today. So money scripts, what are money scripts? Money scripts, they're lies that we tell ourselves both consciously and subconsciously and the behaviors we adopt to support them. So again, part of what we're doing here is we're getting underneath the hood a little bit. We're seeing what's in that 90% of the subconscious level. So one of the first thing we do is we avoid money. That, that's one of the money, money hurdles that some people cross. And some of the examples of this and, and the signs that you have it is you have less money and lower net worth than the non-avoiders. You tend to overspend and sacrifice your financial well-being for others. You hoard, you avoid looking at bank statements and you have trouble sticking to a budget and you believe money is bad. Avoiders sabotage their own financial success in an unconscious effort to have as little as possible. And some of the associated money scripts with that it are, I don't deserve money. Money is the root of all evil. Wealthy people are corrupt. Having a lot of money makes me a bad person. I just want to help people. I don't care about money. That is a really, really popular one with women. And telling ourselves, well, money can't buy happiness. Yet they believe money would solve all of their problems and go back and forth between hating money and wanting money. Now, the other one is money worship, worshiping the almighty dollar. And with the money block, we believe that money is the key to happiness and the solution to all of our problems. We believe that they never, they believe that they never have enough money and that they'll never be able to afford what they want in life. Worshippers tend to overspend attempting to buy happiness and getting trapped in credit card debt and have lower income and net worth. And some of the scripts, the lies that you tell yourself is, I can never have enough money. 
And, you know, and one of the things when you're saying when you're a money worshiper, it's, it's like you're consumed by it. It's like it's a drug. And you say money will give me the meaning of life. The more money I have, the happier I will be. And all we need to do is watch anywhere, anything in Hollywood or, you know, what's going on with there or, you know, and, and even read what's going on in the news. There are a lot of really, really wealthy people that aren't very happy. So money is just a tool. It doesn't bring us happiness. Or say, I can never be happy if I'm poor. Or if I had more money, things would be better. And you just fantasize, but you don't take action. It just becomes a fantasy. You think that money will actually get to me to where I want to go. But will it buy, will it start that new business? Will it write that new book? Will it buy that new building if you're in real estate? No, it won't because you actually need to take action. So money status, that's another one. The money blocks associated with money status are, I be, they believe their self-worth is determined by their net worth. They overspend trying to convince others they are financially successful. And, you know, these are people that are flaunting it. And they normally have less money than they actually, that they actually have in a lower net worth than they project to have. They're more likely to spend compulsively, be financially dependent financially dependent on others and lie about spending and they gamble a lot. It's all about secrets because they're living a lie. And some of those associated money are I'm only successful is the amount of money that I make. Or things. But again, the headlines are full of people who have a lot of money, a lot of nice things, but they're really, really unhappy underneath the hood. Now, money vigilance, that's another one. Um, that may seem like a really good thing because some of the char characteristics with this are they are watchful, alert, and concerned about their financial well-being. They believe it's important to work hard for their money and to save, and they use credit wisely. They don't gamble or overspend. However, the problem with this is that when they they take savings and frugality to the extreme and they, they have a difficult time spending money or enjoying the fruits of their labor. They say things like, I can't trust anyone with money or people only want me for my money. You know, Ebenezer Scrooge, right? You know, that's what's going on, just hoarding onto the money, hanging on to it. Or I shouldn't spend money on myself or others. And, you know, it's just sitting there, you know, I, you know, I know a few people, you know, that, that, that are miserly with their money and they just count it and count it and count it and count it. And it's like, what, what, what are you doing with that? Other than saying, I've got this pile of cash in front of me, you know, or, or being obsessed and giving to the poor encourages laziness. Or if you have nothing, then you have nothing to lose. But, but what they show time and time and again is that when we give, when, you know, when we have done well for ourselves and we have money, that when we start giving to others, I mean, it's an endorphin rush to know that you're helping others. You know, that also goes into what is your why and what really motivates me to, to keep getting up and doing what I want to do. And so, so when you start getting, you know, putting your money, putting your money aside and start, you know, creating a legacy, you have other people in mind. And you know, the other thing about that is not only you're giving to others, but it gets you outside of yourself. Because if you're always stuck, you know, again, you know, that back, back to the picture with our mind exploding, you know, when we we are all, uh, you know, introspective with everything and we don't go out, we just sit there and cry in our Cheerios. And that is not exactly what's going to get us to where we want to go. That's not taking action. And so that's one of the things I really want to encourage people is when they think about what is your why. And when you start, you know, because I believe every one of us listening here, I know if you're not already successful with your money, I know you're well on your way. And so this will be one thing to start encouraging and saying, I don't want to be a hoarder. I don't want to keep it to myself. I want to bless others. And so, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about, you know, what are your, your mind blocks? And so obviously, you know, if we just go one way, let's talk about a little bit about how, how can we overcome these? So one of the first things we can do is admit them. Again, bringing the subconscious 
shift into our consciousness. So what I want you to do right now, I want to take a couple minutes and I want you to think about if anything I've said so far resonates with you and then put it in the chat. And I guess I should put the chat up if I want to be able to see what you're saying, huh? Okay, so the next thing you can do is you can adopt an abundance mentality. And I know Miss Mandy McAllister loves this. Um, she is all about abundance. And, you know, I had heard about an abundance mentality before I came to AWAM, but it was very kind of like pie in the sky. People didn't really talk about it and show what it's about. You know, that's been really great within the group because we have a lot of women in this group that do have an abundance mentality. And it's really, really helps to continue to give it, remind us of those messages that, that help us grow and help us get to the next level. So an abundance mentality says that there is enough for everyone. Scarcity, the opposite of it, says that there's only enough for a select few. So back to the Ebenezer Scro Scro Scrooge that we just talked about is that's a scarcity mentality. That's saying that if I give, if you take a little bit for me, there, or, or if, if, I, if, if I give some of mine, there's not going to be enough for me. Where there is abundance, there is enough for everybody, you know, and I truly believe each one of us are here brought for a significant purpose. So, and, and I am able to do what I need to do. So if I'm worried about Sally, Sally's going to have enough for her because she's here to, to, to um, live, live out her purpose and what she's meant to do. So another thing you can do is surround yourself by ab abundant minded people, which obviously you guys are doing that because you know about this presentation and you're a part of this group. You know, it's in one of the other presentations I give, I where I spend a lot more time on tribe. Um, I, I have a picture underneath this of people, you know, doing this and looking sad and looking upset. And it's like when you are around people that are open, that are that are looking for um, ways to grow and and ways to think creativity, creatively, creativity, <laughs> creatively, thank you, um, is that uh, it really, really helps. And that that kind of stuff, as, as I said earlier, when, when you're negative, that that comes on to you, but also when you're positive, that that also is, it's really infectious and it really helps lift each other up. And that's what we do. We wanna really surround ourselves around a really good tribe. Now, the other thing is to drop victimhood because everybody's got a sad story. Every single person has a sad story, if not multiple sad stories, that's true. But one of the things that you can do is start thinking about what did I learn from that? You know, and Tony Robbins does this thing that I love and it's called blaming, blaming um, others effectively. And that is, if somebody hurt you, um, or, you know, or abandon you, you can say, thank you so much for doing that because you made me dig deep and did look at myself and find out what's important to me. And I actually discovered you're not a healthy person for me. And I am so grateful for that because I know about myself and it made me grow. And so when we live in victimhood, we're always thinking about who wronged me, what went, you know, what went sideways it does not help us to get to where we want to go. And so just because you're born poor doesn't mean you need to stay there and that um, we were created to thrive. Now, the other thing you can do is you can rewrite the script. Your new belief might look something like this. Money supports my happiness. Money is a tool that I use to do good in the world. Whenever you feel your old belief creeping up, Make the conscious decision to stop in your tracks and say your new money belief out loud. And another thing, another technique is to adopt some new money beliefs are bedtime affirmations. Now they've done studies to show that whatever you think about before you go to bed is the is what your brain will spend the most time processing. So when you start giving yourself new affirmations, and I've got some affirmations to give you um, some ideas of what you can say that can really help you. I pay my bills with joy. I save money every month. I can be both gracious and wealthy. I take good care of my possessions. I'm grateful for what I have and I'm grateful for my life. And so just think if you're saying these things to yourself before you go to sleep, 
that it really can have an impact on how you wake up. Because a lot of times if you if you go to bed and you're really pissy, angry about something, wake up in a pissy and angrier mood often, right? It's not like often it, it solves. So let's give ourselves these positive affirmations of, of, of how we can rewrite those scripts. Now, the other one is a visualization. Um, and, you know, because imagery is very, very powerful. I just listened to a talk by Mel Robbins the other day. You know, I love Mel Robbins. If you don't know her, I recommend that you go, you go Google her because whatever she says is amazing. But this one really caught my attention because she said vis visualization is one of the things that every billionaire does successfully. She's found that pattern. And that is when you... So when you visualize where you want to be, you start thinking about it, you know, there's because there's something in our brains called the reticular activating system. And what it does is it tells our brain, this is something I want to keep. This is something I want to look at. You know, it's just like, I, you know, if you go and you buy a new white car, all of a sudden, everywhere you go, and let's say it's a white Jeep specifically, everywhere you go, you'll start seeing white Jeeps. Now, the number of white Jeeps hasn't, hasn't multiplied, but all of a sudden, or now you've trained your brain because you were you were shopping for a car that it will look at that. So the same thing happens with our finances. The same thing happens with our goals and our desires and, and other things that we want to do and people we want to hang around. If you don't like your tribe, that's okay. Start I you start visualizing what is who do, what does my tribe look like? What are their characteristics? Where do those people go? And you start seeing yourself there because when you start doing that, your brain will start looking for evidence to say, yes, this is where you belong. This is where you're going and I will help you get there. And another thing I really like to recommend is that, is that you get a vision board. Um, I'm a big proponent of these. I, I know Mandy too, I've seen hers. And, um, and, and you have it in front of you and what you do, and, and this isn't with just with money. So in terms of relationship, what are your relationships? goals? Do you have fitness goals, body goals? Do you have them? And then you, obviously the finances, what we're talking about today, but also um, you got other areas of your life that, um, you know, areas of service and go through all areas of your life. And then you can, and then you can have pictures, you know, people can either write, you, you can write words on your vision board, or you can have pictures, or you can do some combination of that. But that way you're constantly looking at that. So if you wake up visualizing where I wanna go, then all day when you're at work, you see your vision board and then you go to bed and you're visualizing again. These are all really strong, strong vision images that you'll have and you'll be training your brain. That's what I want my life to look like. That's where I'm going. And on those hard days, you'll remember, I, I don't wanna stop. I don't wanna train my brain to start looking for defeat. I want my brain to start looking for victory. So, um, so I hope some of these techniques are helpful for you. And I would love it if you can share in the chat if any of these um, were helpful for you. And one thing I would really like you to do is take this time right now. And I would like you to write down three new scripts that you'll start saying tonight when you go to bed. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to start doing that. Okay, who wants to share with us? Mandy? I will. Um, do you wanna unshare your screen so we can see participants? Oh, oh yes. Okay, so I'll pin myself. Um, so uh, as I, here's my new favorite. As I grow my wealth, I grow my impact. Ooh, that's good. My new favorite. Uh, I use money to positively impact lives, especially those who I love the most. And uh, I live a life of, uh, of abundance in time, joy, and money. Ooh, those are good. Who else is Who's going next? to share with us? I'll do mine. Um, <clears throat> my first one is I have worked hard to earn money while I sleep, which was difficult for me. Cause I always thought like, you know, my, my, my money script is 
you have to get up, go pull up your bootstraps and go earn it. So getting money without earning it was, has been difficult for me, but that's my first one. Number two, um, my background and experience, it has monetary value to my clients. Ooh, that's good. And then lastly is I invest my money wisely in good and profitable ventures. That's great. Who else? We got brave souls out there. Nikki, I'm looking at you. Julie, I'm I looking know. at you. I know. Like we had you all over the chat. Let's see you live, girl. <laughs> there you are. So um, I actually trying to do W2 work at the same time. But okay. um, generally, my big thing is, is I have, I'm very good with my self-talk. Mine is more teaching my son to use good and wholesome self-talk and teaching my husband to use good and wholesome self-talk mm -hmm. and really enjoying the process for the process, not focusing on if I just have a million dollars, I'm successful. If we just, you know, reach 20 years and get a retirement check, I'm successful. But like, what does that mean today and tomorrow? And what are you willing to give up for that? And so my son is five. So we talk a lot about like at little kid level, you know, like, what does it take to be happy? Do you need magnetiles to be happy? Or do you need <laughs> to enjoy the room full of toys you already have? And how does money work with that? So um, it's more like family affirmations and like modeling good behavior is kind of what I'm sort of focused on this year. Well, you know, that's really good though. I mean, because especially as we were just talking about is you know, we, we think about what did our parents tell us and how did that impact us? And we're just talking about how that impacts that 90% of our subconscious. And so to think we have that same responsibility on our children, you know, they are watching us, they are modeling us. And that well, good for especially you. when you do it right, and you're raising the future 1%, how do you raise a good person versus an entitled kid who never had to like be in the trenches so it's it's I want to give him the value of being in the trenches without the heartache of like where's food going to come from tomorrow which is a formative part of you know a lot of people's journey but I prefer that not be part of my son's journey I also would prefer that he's not the kid on the playground who's like I bought a car I'm 14 <laughs> you know so yeah so what are some of the things you've been doing um, the first and foremost is we live completely within our means. We picked a number years ago and we just lived within it and, and we can make $300,000 a year or $60,000 a year. Our, the way that we live has not changed because we live to a point where we are comfortable, we are happy, we have our needs met, we have our reasonable wants met and everything beyond that, it, it, it better be important and real. Um, it better not just be a thing to make other people uh, envious of us. So I'd kind of be happy if we got to like his teenage years and, and, and he has been going through the process and seeing our balance sheet and going, but why don't we live in a certain way and being like, have you suffered at all for not having lived that way? So yeah. it's just modeling that money can make you happy, but it doesn't have to be the only thing that makes you happy. Is it, what are some of the other things that, that people have done to, to help their kids with this? Especially folks with older kids. Who's got older kids? I'd love to know that so I can steal ideas. Well, I work with Kylie on helping her understand like a con, like even she just turned 13, but even with that, like their, <clears throat> their concept of money is like, really weird because like to her if she has a thousand dollars in her piggy bank she's rich but what we're trying you know what I mean versus but then she looks at a house and she thinks oh well a house is I don't know five hundred thousand dollars or something so it's like her her perception of like what things cost versus what she has is so weird um so for her what I've been working on is helping her realize it doesn't matter how much money you have. Like the amount of money you have mm -hmm. is pointless. What matters is what consistent income are you able to generate? 
And so what I was bringing up to her was if you have this much money, that's great. It, but let's say you spend this much a month. Well, how yeah. fast is that money going to run out? Versus if you have a regular income or if you're able to generate income at whatever level, well, guess what? Yeah. Now you can maintain this lifestyle in perpetuity, right? So getting her to understand it doesn't matter how much money you have. It's the income you can generate with that um, and figuring out. We, we've been talking a lot about like, okay, well, what does it take to, you know, earn this income? Well, you know, we talk about revenues and expenses and all of that. So that's kind of what we've talked about. Um, other than that, I teach her a lot about taxes, but that's, that's well, kind of I'm going to tell on you too, Erica. And by the way, everybody, <laughs> I didn't introduce her. This is my partner, Erica Neal, and she mm -hmm. rocks and she's the best financial instructor in the planet. So, um, so yeah. I love her. I love her. So I have to tell you, because when we were when we were down doing our strategy meeting and it was just around tax time, she's not kidding. It's not to say, kids, we need to have taxes. You know, taxes exist. It's something we all play, blah, blah, blah. She gets down into the trenches with her daughter. And I was so impressed with that level of detail. Do you do you want to tell them a little bit about what you did? Uh, which one was it the marginal or was it the tax write-offs? Well, both the fact that your daughter was 13 years old and you were telling her about, yeah, both of those things. Yeah. She, she knows the difference between marginal effective tax rates and how business owners can make more money because they have the ability to write things off. And so she, she understands and she even knows like if we're out and about and I talk about like a new computer or this or that. And to her, like what we talk about is the cost of this computer is 20% less because it's a write-off for the business. So that cost of the computer isn't as bad as what it would be as if I weren't a business owner. Yeah. And, and do, and do, have others talked to their kids about the importance of cash flow? I mean, that's one thing that I spend a lot of time talking about is having multiple streams and especially in this kind of environment that it's, you know, it's, it's really important to not just be dependent on a one stream. So it's, my son is not old enough to understand streams of income yet, um, other than like I have it and he doesn't. But <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing that, that we did um, starting about two months before he was born is we put aside $500 every month for him. And the goal was over the course of 18 years, we would invest that money for him and then with him and then transition it to him. And even yeah. if he never makes a penny at 18 years old, he gets $100,000. But the goal is by the time he turns 18 and has full control over that money, that $100,000 will have become multiple revenue streams. Yeah. But knowing that that's already in play has already taken some of the pressure, I think, that a lot of parents feel off of me because I know when he's, when he graduates high school, I will be able to hand him a hundred thousand dollar at least get started with life fund. And because we're military, we were able to transfer the Montgomery GI bill to him. So college is paid for. So we don't super worry about like how to fund college. So those are two really big parental stresses. That's just right off the bat, off our shoulders. But the other thing it allowed us to do is my husband and I already talk quite a bit about options he has. Mm -hmm are not just go to college, get job. And I'm okay if that's what he chooses, but knowing that we have the skill sets to give him an education on multiple streams of income, passive mm -hmm. streams of income, and you know how to get an education that results in income or get an education that results in you giving back to humanity because you want to, knowing that you have other streams of income coming in. Right. It's been really helpful in like, we don't put those like micro pressures on him that I, I like I already see even at like five, six years old, I see people saying things like, oh, you're going to be a doctor someday. And like, I don't have to put those projections on mm -hmm. my child because we have systems in place where he'll be, as long as he doesn't, you know, actively blow it, he'll be fine. Yeah, no, I, I, I have one son who, who's now in college, he's a sophomore in college, and then I have another one who's a senior, and, you know, my oldest one is definitely, 
he is he's in a really he's he's doing packaging sciences and it's a very very lucrative career but he's also it's really interesting because he's now been watching some of the things that i've been doing because i've all you know i've always had more of that entrepreneurial flair myself and um and i was in i was in the traditional invest, investment world for um 25 years and now i've been and 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 a lot while i while i was doing that i was also had a few other multiple streams of income as well but it's it's really nice to know even if they go that w2 route that it's nice to have supplements to that and then also you know teaching the kids the you know just giving them an entrepreneurial spirit even if they don't want to be an entrepreneur themselves just to be thinking like an entrepreneur because that really makes you a very valuable employee and it also and again and if, and if you're an entrepreneur the kind of things that you have to think about you have to think about other people you have to think about the the finances the creativity the life cycle and everything is there's so many skills that you can be teaching your kids along those entrepreneurial ventures and i i know everybody in this group um is is pretty much involved in real estate. So that's obviously a really good place that you can be doing a lot of that. Does, does, has, are there any books specifically that you guys have been having your kids read? My kiddo's too young. Yeah, his, he's, he's watching mama. It's true. Yeah. And we, we drive around and we're, we're going real estate investing. I usually have to bribe him with a happy meal, but right. uh, he, he gets that we, we buy these houses to help other people's lives. So they have a clean, safe place to live. So that's, that's a neat thing to get to, to share with him. And again, it's not, and, and with that, it's not always our words, it's our actions. And we just don't, we don't realize what an impact that has on our kiddos and watching what we're doing. So again, mine's too young to read, but I've actually started. How old is he? He's he's five. Five. I've okay. Befriending um, authors on finance topics because I found that generally they're super willing to talk to you. So um, one guy that I talk to all the time online is a gentleman named Doug Nordman, who mm -hmm. um, wrote a book with his daughter Carolyn about yeah. uh, raising children with like good financial education. And like, he's just a super cool dude. So if anybody just wants to reach out to somebody with a ton of experience, Doug's a great guy. Uh, that's great to know. Yeah, and I, and I have to tell you what Erica just said in the chat is true. That she, um, she was bribing her daughter to read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and she actually said that she wanted to read our book. So she's raising her very, very well. So one of the things that I wanted to share with everybody too is if I could get the screen back, I was going to share some really interesting, I was, I wanted to talk a little bit about financial literacy and why that's, that's such a big deal and some stats that are, um, if I could do that. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about why we started financial literacy for her in the first place is um, one of the things that John Wolfgang had said was many people take no care of their money until they have come to the end of it. And that is a very, very powerful quote. And one of the things that had happened for me is I was in the traditional investment world for 25 years. And so I continually saw women that were going through some sort of life change and they were also, or, you know, whether, whether it was a divorce or most often it was like their, their spouse had passed away and they realized that they didn't have enough money for the retirement. And so they wanted to, you know, what, what a terrible message to have to convey to them. And it just absolutely broke my heart. So one of the things that I wanted to do when I left that business was I wanted to be able to do something about it. And I started to dive in a little bit more to the financial literacy stats. 53% of adults describe themselves as stressed over money. And my guess is that stat is probably even a little bit higher now that we've gone through this whole COVID and there's been a lot of insecurity with that. And um, some other startling stats are three in five adults do not have a budget. 78% of people live paycheck to paycheck. Two in three families don't have an emergency fund. So just think about what this means. You know, we're, we are amongst people right now that are thinking about these things. But 
these stats say the majority of the country is not in that same situation. I mean, it's, it's a crisis, people. It really is because this is the, you know, the, this is what we're passing on to our kids. You know, we, you know, we were raised by parents whose parent, you know, our grandparents were often, they, they were brought up during the depression. And so they actually, you know, were hanging on to money. Budgeting was a very, very big deal to that generation. And so right now we have people that just like, mm, you know, especially when we've been in this time where the government's been throwing, you know, throwing money at people and people just not really thinking about it, you know, and this is something, you know, especially with us in the multifamily, this is something that impacts all, all of our um, tenants. It's a, it's a really big deal and we need to think about that. And this is another thing with the stats with women. 51% of the wealth in this country is controlled by women. Now, most people don't realize that, but some other stats that are interesting too is that for only 49% of women feel confident speaking to a financial advisor. This, this was a study done by um, Fidelity, just full disclosure, who, who the source of the stat was. And another one is 80% of women refrain discussing finances with friends or family. And one other stat that didn't make it, but I was talking to Erica just before this call, is that um, eight, it was 80%, I believe, Erica, correct me if I was wrong. Um, and that is that 80% um, of women who took a financial literacy test actually failed it. And that was done by, um, you know, that was a national financial literacy organization that actually took that. Now that, that is a really big deal. And most people, you know, a lot of people aren't even aware that it's, it, that is so stark. And a lot of the, a lot of the issue is, and I, and I, you know, I've seen this amongst my friends and I've seen it, uh, I've seen it in the business is a lot of times girls aren't talking to talk about money. They're not comfortable talking about money. They don't feel safe talking about money for one reason or another. And so that's one of the big reasons why we had created the, the financial literacy for her. And um, so the mission statement that we have for financial literacy for her is to rectify the financial illiteracy epidemic by delivering a program that promotes a healthy mindset and financial habits. We provide credible resources rooted in transparency, integrity, and honesty. Utilizing our specially trained leaders and support network, we nurture women to discover their personal and financial identities while encouraging positive relationships and generational impact. And so that, that is what we're doing um, with um, at financial literacy for her. And we did start a group, um, it's called Mind of Gold, and it's helping single moms better understand personal finance. We actually are changing the name of that because Erica and I are being stalked by creepy men who have seen us um, literally getting really inappropriate pictures from the same guy, Both they're getting both of us. So Facebook won't let me take the single out of it until next um, Sunday, but I'll be taking out plus some more women said they want to have a, a broader context for that, but we will be keeping the name of Mind of Gold. The other thing is we have a book, um, as we've already talked about, Mind of Gold, A Girlfriend's Guide to Financial Freedom. We also have a workbook that goes along with that. And one of the things that we will be doing is we are going to be doing a challenge. We're going to be doing a three-day challenge and I want to get the dates right here. It is January 25th to 27th. And so for the members of AWAM, those listening to this, we are going to give them VIP passes for that. So it will be the January 25th to 27th at two o'clock Eastern time. And so we did the Eastern time. So a lot of people can squeeze that in during their lunch. This is a Tuesday through Thursday. Um, and so what we'll be covering on that is the first day will be, be overcoming, overcoming mindset issues. And within that, I just, I just covered a narrow piece of that today. We covered these mind blocks, but also there's seven growth gaps, um, 
re excuses that almost everybody faces when they're trying to, to step into anything, whether it's a new career, new budgeting, et cetera. We also, one of the big things um, we look at at Financial Literacy for Her is we try to help women look at their purpose and they try to align their goals with that. Because, you know, some people don't feel called to going into an area where they're going to make lots of money. And if that's not where their value system, that's okay. But regardless of where you, where you feel called and what kind of income you make, you need to make sure that your your budget and your finances are in alignment with that and will carry you through throughout your um through throughout the rest of your life and into your legacy. And then Erica has a really awesome course and she's going um she's she'll we offer this in several different areas, but it's five steps to creating an effective budget. It's awesome. And I I actually just took our challenge the other day from a student's perspective, from an audience owner's perspective. And let me tell you, I, I was really excited with Erica's budget. She's my partner, but she's also a great, great, great instructor. I love her to death. And so what we do on day three is we'll be talking about new financial habits. We'll be talking about systems, 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 because systems are so important. And then also the importance of accountability. So uh, most of you that are, are live on this call, I know you're big fans already of having accountability, but accountability is so important to sticking to our goals. And, you know, and back when I was talking about the abundance mentality and, a, and an abundance minded tribe, you want, you want people in your close network, they're people who are being coached by somebody else. Because one of the best things you can always do, you can be being mentored by somebody and you can be mentoring somebody where you're lift, reaching up and reaching down. And so that's one of the big things that we'll be talking about. And so we're also training coaches so that we'll be able to do group coaching. And so we really want a support network to be able to have people come and talk about these issues. And it, and it, and it will be a safe place to talk about finances because again, as those stats bear out, I mean, those are pretty frightening stats that we just talked about. People aren't comfortable talking about it. We wanted to give them a safe place to do that. And one of the other thing is we've launched three financial courses. We have one that's a mini course. This is a three, three module mini course. And this, again, this, it's my, it will be, it, that's similar to what the challenge is. That it talks about mindset issues, five steps to an effective budget and systems to stick to it. We've got a starter course. And this is for people that are really ready to get moving on it. And, um, and, and so the structure that we have with all of our program is it, it's mindset. And then we cover five categories. We cover budgeting, we cover credit, we cover um, taxation, retirement, and investing. And so with each one of those, we have three levels. So we have introduction, the introductory, the intermediate, and the more advanced for each one of those categories. So what we've done with this starter course is for those that really, really don't know where to begin. And again, that sounds like that's about 80% of women. So there's a lot of people that fall in this category. They can start out with the starter course and it covers all of those categories. And one of the things that we do is between each one, of the, the chapters or within the courses, we have what I call a mindset minute. So they're teaching you things you can do such as meditation, sort, such as doing a gratitude journal, such as all the different mindset hacks that you can do with habit stacking, habit forming, that kind of thing. And then, um, and then we have one that's a comprehensive course that is basically the book in the video form. So those are the courses that we can go to. And one of the things that we'll be doing is for that challenge, for any of you, again, um, that are listening to this, we will give you a free VIP pass to the, uh, to the mini course. Also, we will be giving you a free digital workbook. And I really recommend you get this digital workbook because it goes through all of those categories. And it really gives you, it's, it's really fresher if you've done that before. If not, it really can help you take your game to the next level. And so also we'll give you a big dis. We'll also be giving you a discount to any of these financial courses you're interested in. So what I'd like you to do is if you, um, oh, and one last thing that I wanted to let you know that we have, we have a scholarship fund. And what we do with the scholarship fund is um, this is, we both of us really have a heart for single women. Um, I was raised by a single mom um, later in my teenage years, and I'm currently a single mom. And Erica was raised by a single mom, and she was a single mom for a while. And so we have a real heart 
for single moms who, who really need to step up. And so that's why we've created this scholarship fund because we really, 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 really want to fight this epidemic. So anytime you buy, buy our books those and some of the other things, we will be making a donation to the scholarship fund so we can start giving these courses to women to help them up their game. Um, so what you can do is you can send me an email, Karen at FinnLiteracyForHer.com. Again, Karen at FinnLiteracyForHer.com and just say AWAM offer and I will get all this information to you. With just a few short minutes we have, if anybody have questions for me or Erica while she's on board, you have questions about budgeting, please shoot them with her to us. I don't have any questions about budgeting and I know so much of your stuff is focused on um, single women, but do you guys have any plans or any interest in the future of doing any outreach for like younger women, like school age type thing? Because that, like, there's a huge, huge need for that. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let Erica answer that question. Pick me! Um, yes. Uh, so actually part of our, part of our planning process when Karen and I <clears throat> did our strategy planning meeting last year, was how how can we do exactly what you're saying, Nikki, and branch out and appeal to all the different areas because financial literacy has no target audience. Like, yes, women, there is a large gap, but it does affect a lot of different demographics. Um, it affects them differently and for different reasons, but it's still an epidemic. So to answer your question, yes. In fact, um, we, we got invited, there's a University of Texas at Arlington here in the DFW Metroplex that we actually got connected with, and it is going to be on January 24th and February 7th. We are doing a class for veterans at the UT Arlington Center, and this is specifically, help, it helps veterans transition from military to civilian life. Um, in fact, so we've already got the logos, we've been working on the, it's a lot of the same content, but it's um, a little bit more like an adulting class, like what is health insurance, what is car insurance, what is an HSA, like how does life work, right, how do I set up electricity, whatever, um, but that's called the, it's the financial literacy for her university edition, but it's specifically to target high school and college age, not necessarily have to be in college, but in that age group of, hey, you're starting off your independent life, here is a program for you to go through to be able to do that and feel confident, especially like Karen and, you know, Karen said, like, I'm a first generation college student and I didn't know a thing from anything and I didn't, right? And so I went in and I made a lot of mistakes and I had to learn the hard way because I didn't know and I wasn't taught certain aspects of finance. So to answer your question, Yes, we have the idea. We're, we're branching out. It's just um, a matter of repackaging the content and distributing it in a way that it's actually going to fit who's looking for it for the university edition. Um, and I mean, we even have it. We even talked about over the next couple of years, branching out to do couples, families, kiddos. So, I, you know, we're talking, you know, you guys talk about having five-year-old kiddos, even being able to have a program that 